what we'll do tonight is the guts of section 27. We'll talk more about ideals, we'll talk more about factor rings, and we'll get some sort of intuition going as to what these things look like. Uh, Wednesday we'll do more game. Wednesday will also be uh, faculty course questionnaires, and Wednesday will also be the day that I distribute exam three and final exam information. So you'll definitely want to be here Wednesday to get all that stuff and to fill out the course questionnaires. The following Monday, we'll have a quiz. It'll be quiz five. I'll tell you about the quiz on Wednesday. So Wednesday, again, is a really crucial day to be here. Then the Wednesday of the following week, that's December 5th, there won't be any class. I'll just be in my office. It'll give you some time maybe to prepare and review for the final and exam three. And then exam three slash final happens Wednesday the 12th from 4.30 to 7. So for those of you that maybe have to run out after class to go to work or something, please make sure that you've made arrangements to be able to stick around till 7. Okay. All right. Questions on the overview here? I mean, I'll give you a whole lot of details in the stuff that I hand out on Wednesday, but that's roughly where we'll be for the next two and a half weeks till the end of the semester. Okay, so since it's been a week, let me remind you where we were, where we wound up at the end of a week ago, Monday, and then, well, and, and then, in effect, show you the basic construction that's going to allow us to get to this thing that I talked about last Monday, this basic goal, this place where we're headed. So just to give you a, a brief recap of the goal, recap is this. I'm going to hand you field, we'll call it field E. I'm going to hand you polynomial. The coefficients of that polynomial are going to be in this field E. And what we're interested in doing, well, at least give me a polynomial that has some guts to it. And the goal is this. Try to find a field in which the polynomial has a zero. In other words, find a field in which there's an element so that when you drop the element in everywhere you see an x, that zero comes out. Find a field f so that two things occur. The field that you start with lives inside the new field. Maybe it's the rationals inside the reals. Maybe it's the reals inside the complexes. Maybe it's Z2 sitting inside something that we haven't sort of encountered yet, but we will over the next couple of lectures. And secondly, there is some element, we'll call it alpha, in the bigger field for which when you plug alpha into the polynomial, zero comes out. Phi sub alpha of f of x is zero. Okay. So the, the sort of verbiage, the, the, the statement in English of the basic goal is take a polynomial, find a zero for it somewhere. Now it may already be that the field that you're working in contains a zero for it. If I hand you the polynomial x squared minus four and ask you to find some number in the rationals that you can plug in and have zero come out, easy. Plug in two or plug in minus two makes no difference. But if I hand you something like the field is the reals and I hand you the polynomial x squared plus one, find a field for which that polynomial has zero, well, you've got you to look bigger. You've got to look maybe to the complexes. Can you look at something smaller between the reals and the complexes? Turns out the answer will be no. If I hand you the rationals and I hand you the polynomial x squared minus two and ask you to find a zero for it, find some number so that when you plug it in for x at zero comes out, you're thinking, well, square root of two. Square root of two is not rational, so you've got to build a bigger field. You've got to find a larger field that contains the square root of two. Maybe it's the reals. Eh, maybe it's something smaller, like this thing that we called capital S. This thing that looked like. How do we build that new field? Okay. All right, so that's the goal. Goal, basic goal. All right, here's how. Method. So the reminder is uh, the following definition, and then again, this is something that we did a week ago Monday. I'm just trying to sort of knock the Thanksgiving cobwebs out here. Uh, start with the ring R. Uh, we look at a subset of R is called an ideal. In case two things are true, the first thing I can state easily, if you look at the 
subset together with addition that you get a subgroup of R under addition. Maybe I should have written this as a proper inclusion like this. So a subset is an ideal. And secondly, this thing that we call the absorption property for every, every element N in N and every element R in the ring, when you multiply Rn, you get something back in N. And when you multiply NR, you get something back in N. Okay? That's what it means for a subset of a ring to be an ideal. So the first one requires that the subset is a subgroup. And remember, since addition in a ring is assumed to be commutative, when we talk about a subgroup of a commutative or an abelian group, it's automatically a normal subgroup. So I could have put this, it would have meant the same thing. Remember, that was our notation for a normal subgroup when you close the thing up here. And what we looked at last Monday was some examples of rings and corresponding ideals in those rings. Example, uh, any NZ inside Z is an ideal. Example, if you start with any polynomial you want, what do you want to call it, g of x or f of x or q of x, I don't really care. Let's call it g of x. g of x in f bracket x, where f is any field. Then look at this collection. So what you're thinking is take any polynomial and multiply it by this fixed one g. It's just like we're doing here, take any integer and multiply that integer times all the other integers and tell me what comes out. Take this polynomial and multiply it by all the other polynomials and tell me what comes out. Intuitively, folks, what I'm asking you to do is look at all of the polynomials that you can factor this particular one out of. And I don't care what polynomial you start with. A good example to keep in mind is x squared minus 2 in the situation where f is the rational. Another good example to keep in mind is x squared plus 1 where the underlying field is the reals. Look at all the multiples. Of, okay. So it's the same ideas up here. And as you'll remember, over the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to you know, keep this uh, analogy going between what's going on inside the ring of integers and what's going inside in, uh, on inside these rings f bracket x. All right, we gave this subset a notation uh, is an ideal in f bracket x. All right. Just as a side remark, because this verbiage came up in one of the homework problems, um, folks, if I hand you any ring, no, back up. If I hand you any group, always inside any group, there were two what we called trivial subgroups. A group consisting of just the identity element and the subgroup consisting of the entire group. Same thing happens inside rings. If I hand you any ring, commutative or not, I don't really care. You, with unity or not, I don't really care. There are always inside any ring two ideals. One ideal is the ideal consisting just of the subset zero, and the other is the ideal or the subset consisting of the entire ring R. So example, in any ring for any R, these two subsets, the subset consisting of zero and the subset consisting of the entire ring are always ideals. And I think he calls, this author happens to call both of these trivial ideals. In other parts of the literature, you'll just call this one the trivial ideal. This, okay. So they're always a, the proof. This one is a non-issue. It just is. It's a subgroup of itself under addition, of course, because it's the entire group. Does the ring have the absorption property? Well, yeah. If you take anything in the ring, and you take anything in the ring, and you multiply them together, you get something in the ring. So, I mean, the absorption property is a non-issue for R. The absorption property, you have to work, you know, a tiny bit for zero. This certainly is a subgroup of that under addition. That's a non-issue. The question is whether or not this thing has the absorption property. Well, is it the case that you take anything in this set and anything in the ring, and you do the multiplication, that you get something back in the set? Well, yeah, because remember, we proved that anything ring times zero is again zero. So zero sort of is this sort of uber-absorber, you know, just... Anything you multiply by it, it's going to suck it back in. Right. Now, uh, 
here is a really nice analogy between what's going on in the integers and what's going on in f bracket x. It's something that doesn't go on in general rings. I'll mention, just sort of as a side remark, an example of where it doesn't happen. But at least for now, to play up or to continue playing up this analogy, it turns out that in Z, every ideal, ideal is of the form nz for some integer n. So if somebody says, I'm thinking of an ideal of the integers, well, you may not know exactly what it is, but you know what its form is. Its form is all the multiples of some fixed integer. Maybe it's all the multiples of 3. Maybe it's all the multiples of 10. Maybe it's all the multiples of 1 which gives you all the integers, of course. Maybe it's all the multiples of 0, which gives you this one. So this statement you know, includes the sort of trivial cases, the cases on both ends. Similarly, or analogously, well, you could probably anticipate what I'm about to write down. Inside f bracket x, where f is a field, every ideal is of the form something that looks like this pick some polynomial and multiply that particular polynomial times all the other polynomials, you get an ideal. And that turns out to be all the ideals. In f bracket x, every ideal is of the form g of x times capital F of x. I prefer this notation, folks, because it's analogous to this notation. This notation with the brackets, nah, I might use it, but I, I just prefer this because it sort of more directly tells you what's going on. You're starting with whatever polynomial you want. You're simply multiplying it times all the other polynomials in f bracket x. Uh, is of this form for some g of x in f bracket x. So if somebody says, I'm thinking of an ideal inside f bracket x, then necessarily there's some special polynomial floating around, g of x, for which that ideal is precisely all the multiples of that particular polynomial, g of x. g might change. For instance, it might be the case that you're looking at q bracket x and you decide to look at all the multiples of the particular polynomial x squared minus 2. Or you're looking inside r bracket x, where r is the reals, and you decide to look at all polynomials of the form multiples of x squared plus 1. Or you're looking in, let me throw a third one in the pile here. You're looking in z2x, and you've decided to choose the polynomial x cubed plus x plus 1 as g of x. And you're looking at all multiples of that particular polynomial. That is an idea. And it turns out those will be special. Now, it is not mm, coincidental that the three examples that I just sort of spouted out there happen to be situations where you have an irreducible polynomial inside the given f bracket x, and you decide to look at all multiples of it. So x squared minus 2 inside q bracket x, look at all multiples of it. x squared plus 1 inside r bracket x, look at all multiples of it. x cubed plus x plus 1 inside z2x, look at all multiples of it. Those will eventually play special roles. Those will allow us to get to this thing that we're calling the basic goal. Okay. All right. Questions, comments, remarks? So the hope is by sort of continuing to, to spout these many examples, you, you're starting to get the, the feel for what we're going to eventually do. Well, now we have these two pieces. Mm. No, let me say a little bit more, and then we'll go. Then we'll go from there. So, turns out, proposition, hmm, no. OK, construction. The construction is this, folks. We're going to start with a ring. So start with R. This is a brief recap, but this is going to be sort of the springboard for the guts of tonight's presentation. Uh, start with any ring R. Uh, and let n be, no, let me play it up this way. Let, let's call it, 
How about H? B a subgroup of R with plus. So what I want you to do is just focus on the additive structure now. Forget the multiplication for a minute. Just look, R with plus is an abelian group. Take your favorite subgroup. You want to take the multiples of 2 inside Z, that's fine. All right, so here's the point. Then necessarily H is normal in R. Reason? Because addition is assumed to be commutative inside a ring. Plus is commutative. So as soon as you have a subgroup, it's necessarily normal. So we can form the factor group. All right, that was somewhat stomach turning for a while, but then you started got used to it and said, all right, I know what these factor groups look like. These cosat groups, you just sort of write down all the cosets and then add them as if you're just, you know, adding all the cosets together and you get another coset or you can just add coset representatives, that's okay. Mhm. Mm so here's what they look like. Cosets look like look like I don't know, R plus H, maybe R1 plus H, R2 plus H, you know, R3 plus H, etc. How many are there? I don't know, it depends. If you start with the integers and you let the subgroup be 4Z, then there's four of them. If you start with the integers and you let the subgroup be zero, then there's infinitely many of them. Infinitely many cosets. It turns out if you start with Q bracket X, and you look at the subgroup consisting of all the multiples of x squared minus 2, under addition, there's infinitely many different cosets. It's okay. But here's the point. Big question, question. Can we define a multiplication? Multiplication on these cosets, on the collection, of cosets, and notice folks, the cosets are, I'm going to refer to them as the additive cosets. It's the cosets that we're forming by looking at the cosets under addition. And that's legit because addition is commutative and we know how to form cosets for any normal subgroup. Uh -huh. uh, so that this set, R slash H, actually becomes a ring becomes a ring. That's the goal. Hmm. And the answer turns out to be this. If all you've told me is that you've picked out a subgroup of the ring under addition and you form the factor group under addition and then you simply try to multiply cosets together the result in general is going to be a disaster. And it's going to be the same sort of disaster as we encountered when we were trying to decide when uh, the operation inside the factor groups was well defined. Remember, what did we need? We needed something extra. Well, when we tried to, def to make the operation on cosets well defined, we needed that the subgroup was normal. All right. It turns out, if you want to try to define a multiplication on these additive cosets, in general, it's not going to be well defined. So it turns out, in general, in general, well, things crash just like they did in groups, unless you have an extra condition. In general, if we try to define a multiplication, a multiplication on cosets. Well, you know, if there's any justice, here's what you do. R1 plus H, there's a coset. R2 plus H. I mean, what do you suspect a good choice for a definition of multiplication would be? Just multiply R1 times R2, which makes sense inside the ring, and look at that coset. R1, R2 plus H. Good idea. I mean, this makes sense because we're living inside a ring. Okay. The issue is that might not be well defined. 
uh, this might not be well defined. Well defined. I'm not going to show you the examples, but they are easy to write down. But, and here's the theorem. Theorem. If the subgroup that you start with happens to have this extra property, this absorption property, so we put it together in one word, if the subgroup that you're starting with inside the ring is actually an ideal, then the punchline is this multiplication on the additive cosets is actually well defined. And in fact, now that you've got an addition, coset addition, and a multiplication that's well defined, it turns out that makes the additive cosets into a ring. If n is an ideal of r. In other words, if we have this extra hypothesis on n that it has this absorption property, then this collection of cosets together with coset addition and the multiplication defined above, given above, just multiply as you'd hope. Take the two cosets, multiply them together, it's well defined, is a ring. What do you want to call it? The factor ring instead of the factor group. Now I'm going to leave out the proof. The proof is, I mean, it's uh, omitted or left to the reader or whatever appropriate phrases. The point though is we can now build new rings from existing rings and ideals. Just form the factor. You think, well, that looks mysterious. It turns out, folks, it's not mysterious at all because you're totally familiar with these constructions, at least in the case of the integers. Example, well, take z. There's my ring. Take an ideal, I don't know, how about 4z, 4z. All right, now what are we going to do? We're going to form the factor ring. Well, 4z is an ideal, so that makes sense. So we're going to look at z slash 4z. The point is, folks, we've already investigated what this thing looks like as a group under addition, and we wrote down the table of that thing many times. That's just z sub 4, the cyclic group having four elements. So is well known. It's just z4. It's just z4, cyclic group of order 4, cyclic of order 4. Remember the operation here is plus. But now the point is, because 4z is an ideal, it turns out we can actually do multiplication here. And, well, it shouldn't be any surprise. And the multiplication that turns out to be multiplication given by this definition, just take the coset representatives and multiply them together, is nothing more than multiplication mod 4. So here is the uh, table for multiplication in the factor ring. Looks like this. Well, let's see, what do the elements in the factor ring look like? Remember, they could be written as these cosets. This is 0 plus 4z, 1 plus 4z, 2 plus 4z, 3 plus 4z, and Alright, so what's the multiplication? The multiplication is just multiply the two representatives together and write down its coset. So zero, well, so that's easy. Look, folks, zero times anything is just zero. So the first row is just zeros. That's easy. And one times zero is zero, and two times zero is zero, and three times zero is zero. The fact that this is also seven bar, this is four bar, it doesn't make any difference. You can use whatever representatives you want. Multiply together and just tell me what that coset is. All right, one times one is one. So, look, this is a this is a perfect lecture to run this video by because I'm about to do multiplication here. Why? One, <laughs> two times one times one is one. Two times one is two. Three times one is three. That's good. Huh? One times two is two. News to anybody yet? Let's keep going until we mess things up.
1 times 3 is 3. All right, now I'll get to mess things up. 2 times 2 is 0. Because 2 times 2 is 4. 4 is the same cos as 0. 2 times 3 is 6, but 6 bar is the same as 2 bar because 2 is congruent to 6 mod 4. 3 times 2 is 6, so I'd write down 6 bar, but 6 bar is the same as 2 bar. And 3 times 3 is 9, which is the same as 1. How did I do there? 3 times 3 is 9, but we're doing arithmetic mod 4. And 9 is 1 mod 4. So there's the multiplication table. Questions? Now all we're doing is multiplication mod 4. So you may have seen this, maybe in computer science courses or something like that, star mod 4, or multiplication mod 4. But putting the bar on there is really just coset representatives. All right. Questions there? Now, the big example is this. R is Q bracket X. So polynomials with coefficients and the rationals. The ideal I'm interested in is this one. Okay, all multiples of the particular polynomial x squared minus 2. Well, it turns out, folks, that this ring, well, will turn out to be a extremely important piece of this big puzzle that we're trying to solve, this basic goal. The slightly unfortunate thing about that ring is I can't just write out what its table is because it happens to contain infinitely many elements. Okay, But here's a point I want to make about it. Note, uh, R mod n at least has infinitely many elements. And before the Thanksgiving break I wrote out some of those. You know, 1 plus n, or 1 bar, 2 bar, 3 bar. Now remember what it means to say that two expressions are equal in the coset group, in the factor group. What does it mean to say two cosets are the same? It means if you compare the two coset representatives, if you subtract the two, that you get something that's in the subgroup. That's what it means for two cosets to be equal. So that, for example, when we said 6 bar was the same as 2 bar, the reason that's the case is because 6 minus 2 this thing we called A, B inverse, right? But we're using additive notation here. So A minus B is in the subgroup. Well, 6 minus 2 is 4, which is in the subgroup. Uh, 9 minus 1 is 8, which is in the subgroup. Hmm. So here's the point. Note that if we take any constant term, Constant means any rational or any linear term. That these, the cosets for these terms, such terms, must be different. The statement is essentially this. Uh, if I look at 1 plus n, should I call it 1 bar? Yeah, I'd prefer to do that. It's a whole lot easier to manage here. That's a particular element of this coset group because I've taken something in the ring, 1. It's a polynomial of degree 0. That's fine. And I've looked at the coset that it generates. So I've added it to everything in here. Is not equal to this. which is not equal to, oops, bad notation, sorry. <laughs> Apples and oranges, all right, 3 plus n. I said, well, silly, how could they be the same? Well, I mean, think about over here, when n was 4z, you know, 1 bar was the same as 5 bar, which was the same as 9 bar. The point is that can't happen here. The reason it can't happen is, how do you determine when two cosets are the same? You take the two representatives, you subtract them, and you ask whether or not you get something inside the subgroup. You ask whether or not, in this case, you get some multiple of x squared minus 2. Well, folks, if you've got something inside this subgroup, 
There's only two choices. One is you're either looking at zero. That's a perfectly good multiple of x squared minus 2 is x squared minus 2 times 0. But if you look at something that's not 0 inside here, it has to have degree at least 2. Because you're multiplying by some polynomial of degree at least 2. So here's the question. Can I hand you two constant terms and subtract them and get a polynomial that has degree at least 2? Of course not. I get polynomials of degree 0. Or hey, you know, I mean, one bar is the same as one bar. Duh, but I mean, that's only because you're looking at the same element twice. If I take 2 minus 1, I get a polynomial of degree 0. It's not in there because non-zero elements of this thing are degree at least 2. If I take x plus n, that's a perfectly good element inside r slash n. Why? Because, well, I've taken some element of the ring and I've looked at the coset that it generates. Technically, what I've asked you to do is add x to everything in here. And the claim is that this coset and, for instance, that coset can't be the same. Why? Because when you subtract x minus 1, you can't get a multiple of x squared minus 2 because any multiple of x squared minus 2 has degree at least 2. And x minus 1 is a polynomial of degree 1. So as long as you're mucking around inside either constant terms or linear terms, there's no way that any two such cosets can be equal to each other. Okay? That's going to be an important property that we will use later on. In effect, what it means is this. You know, when we're working in z mod 4z, the number 1 sort of behaves like the number 1 inside the integers. It's just, if you're working inside z mod 4z and you add 1 to itself 4 times, you get 0. Well, that certainly doesn't happen in the integers. The point over here is going to be this. If I hand you a rational number, it's going to behave inside the rational numbers the same way that it behaves inside this factor ring. You know, 3 plus 3 is 6, plus 3 is 9, plus 3 is 12. And none of those things are going to be the same as 0 inside this factor. Similarly, x plus x is 2x plus 3x. x is going to behave like x always behaves. It's not going to somehow magically become 0. Because constant terms and linear terms somehow can't ever trip over each other or somehow become the same as each other. Because you can't ever take constant or linear terms and subtract them and get a multiple of x squared minus 2, because x squared minus 2 has degree 2. Huh. All right. But, and here is the key idea, and I showed you this before the break, and I'll show it to you again, because if you can sort of grasp what's going on here, then in effect you'll have seen the key to achieving this basic goal, which is this. Note. If we look at this in uh, Qx mod, so inside this ring, that's the same ring that we've been looking at here. I just wrote it out in, in well, in this notation just to start getting you used to it. Look at, I'm going to call this element alpha. It's the element that you get by looking at x bar. I'll remind you what that means. In other words, take the specific element x. Take the specific element x, well, that's certainly an element in here, and tell me what coset it generates inside this vector ring, inside this coset ring. In other words, take x and add it to everything in there. That's a perfectly good element in here. Now, here's what I want you to do. Take alpha, and inside this ring, Multiply it times itself. Hmm. Okay, well, hey, we know what the definition of multiplication is inside these factorings. You just multiply the coset representative together. Well, I've asked you to take the same element twice. In other words, use the same coset representative twice. So this is by definition x times x plus Non-issue. Just multiply the coset representatives together. But here is the key. This is the same coset as this coset. Why? How do you decide when two cosets are the same? You take this coset representative, you subtract that one from it, and you ask whether or not you get something inside the subgroup. If I take x squared minus 2, do I get a multiple of x squared minus 2? Yeah, I get x squared minus 2 times 1. So that's no big deal. 
So the point is this, folks. What I've found inside this factor ring is some element called alpha. I wrote it down. There it is. It's not some mysterious thing. It's that thing with the property that when you multiply it times itself, you get the same thing as 2. In other words, you get an element whose square is 2. You might say, well, it's not really 2. It's like, you know, it's 2 plus that. It's the coset of 2. Yeah, but, you know, 2 walks and talks inside the coset ring the same way it walks and talks inside a cube. It doesn't become 0 if you add it to itself or anything like that. That was these comments over here. So somehow we've built a coset ring with the property that there is an element in there so that when you square it and you subtract 2, you get 0. That's the same thing as saying that when you square it, you get 2. So it would not be unreasonable to call this a square root of 2, which I've built without this symbol at all. I've just built by computing some sort of ring inside which there's an element that behaves like the square root of 2. Hmm. So here, eventually, is what our basic goal will lead us to. I've just taken a specific polynomial, x squared minus 2. That polynomial is irreducible inside q bracket x. Why? Well, we proved that in class last Monday. You could use Eisenstein's criterion if you want. Or, hey, it's a polynomial of degree 2. It's got no zeros in q, so we can use that other result, however, where you want to get that. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is we've then built this ring. And inside this ring, there is something that walks and talks like a zero of this polynomial. There is something with the property that when you square it and subtract 2, you get 0. That thing happens to look like this. So we've built a ring that has a 0 for x squared minus 2. Does this ring contain the rationals? Sort of. I mean, you know, it's sort of the cosets of the rationals, but the cosets of the rationals behave like the rationals do. Write down the details uh, Wednesday. Hmm. But then the punchline is, but I've produced a thing. I've concretely written down a thing that behaves correctly, whose square is 2. So the only piece that's missing is if we're going to try to use this as this system that contains a square to 2, we have to try to show that this thing is a field. And this is what's going to act as our, what we call, field extension of the rationals. This is going to be the larger field inside which the rationals sit and inside which we've found a zero for the polynomial x squared minus 2. And that, I think, is the most daunting thing for, for students to sort of wrap their heads around. The first time you see these factor rings, they seem like a mess. And you're thinking, well, how the heck am I viewing the rationals as sitting inside here? We'll play with that more. But what's more important for you to see at this moment is that there is something inside this ring that behaves like the square root of 2, whose square is 2. All right. So it will take, I don't know, and it will take 15 or 20 minutes more tonight to start down that road. And then we'll basically be able to finish it up by Wednesday. This ring, this factor ring, turns out to be a field. To be a field which, and I'll use the words in quotes for now, contains the rationals. And contains a zero for the polynomial x squared minus 2. It contains some element so that when you plug it in for x, here's the element, it's called alpha, and you square it and you subtract 2, you get 0. It's zero bar, it's 0. <laughs> OK. So, goal. Show that this thing, that qx mod x squared minus 2qx is actually, actually a field. Mm -hmm. OK. 
Okay. We can do that. We won't write down all the details, but we'll write down most of them. What I'm going to be more interested in doing, folks, is playing up this analogy between what's going on in the integers and what's going on in f bracket x. And we saw, recall, that, let's see, the ring z sub n is a field if and only if n is what? Prime. Right? So we've analyzed what these z sub p rings look like. We proved this, what, two weeks ago? Yeah, two weeks ago. But, let's see, turns out z sub n is the same as, I could use the word isomorphic, but I'd prefer not to here, is the same as the ring z slash nz. When I, for example, wrote down the multiplication inside z slash 4z, and I used the coset notation, 0 bar, 1 bar, 2 bar, 3 bar, etc. The multiplication, folks, was nothing more than multiplication mod, well, mod 4 there, but in general mod n. So if you'd prefer to think of the ring z sub n as the numbers 0 through n minus 1 with addition and multiplication mod n, that's fine. Or if you'd like to view the ring z sub n as the cosets 0 bar, 1 bar, 2 bar, up through m minus 1 bar, just put bars on everything and have the addition and the multiplication being inside z mod nz, you're getting the same sets with the same operations. So I should be using the word isomorphic just because in one copy we're using cosets, in the other copy we're just using integers from 0 to n minus 1. But you can view these as the same. So the point is this. When is the factor ring of the integers by some ideal a field answer precisely when the number that you're using to generate the ideal is prime. Now, what did we do in our analogy between the integers and the polynomial rings? The things that played the role of primes are precisely the irreducible polynomials. And so eventually what we're going to get to, and we'll do it in the next, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes or so, turns out, so restated, restated, we get z slash nz is a field precisely when, if and only if, n is prime. So the primes correspond to those integers that you use to generate ideals that when you look at the factor rings, the corresponding factor ring is a field. So I mean, it's sort of interesting when you hand me the integers, It turns out there's three possibilities that can happen. Hand me the integers, then hand me an ideal. Well, situation one is that you've handed me an ideal that's generated by some prime number. In other words, that consists of all multiples of some prime, two or three or five, I don't care which one. If you then form the factor ring, what you've written down is the field z sub p. If you give me a not prime, but don't give me zero yet, give me a not prime, like six, if you form z6, or in our new notation, z slash 6z, if you form this factor ring, then what you get is something that isn't a field. Heck, it's not even an integral domain. It's got zero divisors. Inside z sub 6, or if you want to think of it as z slash 6z, take 2 bar times 3 bar, you get 6 bar, which in z slash 6z is 0. So you've taken two non-zero things, 2 bar and 3 bar, and multiple, so you get zero divisors. So things sort of crap out there. The third possibility, and it's one that we should take into account, is the ideal that you've handed me is the zero ideal. If you look at z slash zero z, you're looking at z slash zero, it turns out that's just z again. Yeah, okay, it's z bar, but it turns out you get something that's isomorphic to z, which is sort of in the middle. It's not a field, but it's also, you know, it doesn't have any zero divisors. So that's sort of the third rail here. You get either a field or you get not, not an integral domain, or if you happen to mod out zero, you get an integral domain. It's not a field, but you just get the original ring back. The punchline is the exact same thing happens in these rings f bracket x. So it turns out, similarly, 
following is true. In f bracket x, where f is a field, uh, if you look at the factor ring, ring f bracket x mod, let's call it g of x times f bracket x, is a field if and only if, well, if there's an analogous statement to what happens in the integers, if and only if the thing that you're using for all the multiples of that fixed polynomial should be a type of thing that plays the role of prime integer, and that was the notion of an irreducible polynomial. G of x is irreducible in f bracket x. And we'll spend some time proving this. We will prove this over the next 10 or 15 minutes of tonight and into Wednesday. Prove this. But this sort of, again, plays up this analogy between the integers and f bracket x. We can go about producing or finding fields in the following way. Instead of finding a prime number like we did in the integers and go ahead and mod out, we instead hunt around inside f bracket x, find an irreducible polynomial, look at the ideal consisting of all the multiples of that irreducible polynomial, and then forming the factor ring. That will turn out to be a field. All right. So, oh, this factor ring will turn out to be a field precisely from this result. Why? Because in the particular case we looked at in q bracket x, the polynomial that I handed you, x squared minus 2, is irreducible in q bracket x. And therefore, when we form this factor ring, we factor the field. So how do we get here? How to do this? How to do this? And the answer is we need to talk about certain properties of fields. I mean, right here. Do, 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 do. Yeah. We need to, yeah. We need to describe some ideas. Uh, we describe certain properties that some, I'll think of them as the nice or the special or the prime ideals, special ideals have. And here they are, definition. Some ideals will have this property and some won't. Uh, we're going to assume for the remainder of the semester that R is a commutative ring, so R commutative. It turns out you can talk about these ideas in the setting of non-commutative rings as well, but we won't be interested in that and the technical details to start exponentially increasing, so I don't want to go there with this. Then um, an ideal, an ideal N of R, an ideal N inside R is called prime. Notice I'm not talking about prime numbers per se, I'm talking about an ideal being prime or not, obviously in the setting of the integers it will be related to that idea. In case the following is true, for every pair A and B in R, if A, B is in N, then either at least one of, of A or B is in N. So here's what it means for an ideal to be prime. Remember, by definition, it's an ideal, so it already has the absorption property. So it means that if you take anything in the ring and anything in the ideal and you multiply them, you're guaranteed to get something in the ideal. That's already a given piece of information by definition. But what we're now requiring is something more than that. The requirement is if you happen to multiply two things together and the result is in the ideal, that the only way that that can happen is if one or the other of the things that you started with was in the ideal to begin with. That's what it means to be a prime ideal. 
And the second definition is this, we call the ideal maximal. In case the following is true, first of all, the ideal is not the entire ring, and the ideal has the following property, if J is any ideal of R, with this containment being true, N contained in J, which in turn is contained in R, then the only way that can happen is if N is J or N is R. Here's what in English it means for an ideal to be a maximal ideal. It means in effect that the ideal is as big as possible in the sense that, well, you have the ideal, by definition, we're going to assume the ideal isn't the trivial ideal consisting of the whole ring. So take an ideal that actually has some guts to it, meaning that it's not all of R. Maximal means that you can't slide any more ideals in between the given one and the entire ring. I phrased it in the contrapositive language. Maximal means if you happen to have an ideal that's sandwiched between it and the entire ring, then the ideal you're looking at is either it or the entire ring. You can't sandwich anywhere in between. Question? This should be uh, then, oh, J equals R, yeah, thank you. Whoop. Or J equals R. Thank you, Jared. Right, so if you have an ideal, we're calling it N, then this ideal is maximal if it's as big as possible in the sense that there's no we'll call them proper ideals that you can sandwich between it and the entire ring. Let me, well, we'll get out here a little bit early today. Um, let me at least give you a couple of examples of ideals that aren't prime or maximal, just for contrast, and then we'll go ahead and write down a couple of examples of ideals that are prime or maximal inside the integers, and then we'll call it a night. So example, Let's look inside Z. In Z, oh, uh, two, uh, let's look at uh, 6Z is not prime. Now notice I'm using this adjective prime corresponding to an ideal, not to an integer. Why? What does it mean for an ideal to be prime? Prime means every time you have a product that lands in the ideal, the only way that can happen is if one or the other of the two things that you've used was in the ideal to begin with. It's not prime because I can find two things, both of which are outside the ideal. Folks, neither of these are multiples of six. That when I multiply them together, give something that's in the ideal. So there's a not prime ideal. In fact, in general, in general, if n is composite, meaning it's the product of two integers less than itself, then n z is not prime. Now if you're thinking, well, the next statement is, if you look at all multiples of a fixed integer and the corresponding ideal is prime, then the integer is prime. That's good intuition, but it's not 100% true. It's like 99% true. On the other hand, uh, example, this one's sort of interesting. Zero is a prime ideal of z. Well, it's an ideal, that's not an issue. Question, does it have this property? Does it have the property that if you take any two things inside the integers and you multiply them together and the product is in the ideal, is it the case that one or the other of the things that you started with had to be in the ideal? Well, yeah. If you take inside the integers, two integers, and you multiply them together and you get something inside this ideal, it means you've gotten zero as the product of the two integers. And folks, the only way you can get zero as the product of two integers is if one or the other of the two integers was zero to begin with. In other words, if one or the other of the two integers was already inside this ideal. So the proof is reason there are no zero divisors inside Z. 
or the fancy word is z is an integral domain. Hmm. If you have the product two things that give zero, then one or the other has to be zero. All right, now let's finish up what's going on inside the integers. Turns out, and I'm going to haul out a number theory result here. It'll be a straightforward one. In fact, it's one that we used like in week three or something like that. Turns out, if P is prime, a prime number, prime integer, then the ideal PZ is a prime ideal in Z. Proof. What does it mean to be a prime ideal? It means if you take two things in the ring and you multiply them together and the result lands inside the ideal, the only way that could happen is if one or the other of the two things was inside the ideal to begin with. So suppose you take two integers, A and B, and suppose that when you compute their product, that you get something inside this ideal. Then what I want to be able to conclude is one or the other of the two things had to be the, in the ideal to begin with. In other words, what we're supposing is that when you look at the product AB, you get some multiple of P. I don't know, where Z is some integer. So what does this mean? In other words, what we're saying is that the product AB is a multiple of the prime P. AB is a multiple of the prime P, but then the point is, but since P is prime, P is prime, if you have the product of two integers is a multiple of a prime, then uh, either A or B is a multiple of P. And that result's given a name. This is called Euclid's lemma. If you have a multiple of two integers that turns out to be a multiple of some prime number, then one or the other had to be a multiple of that prime number to begin with. And that is the result, i.e., either A is in PZ or B is in PZ. So PZ is prime. So in fact, what we've just done, folks, is we've identified all of the prime ideals inside Z. They're almost exactly the ideals generated by prime numbers, where we understand prime numbers to include the negatives of the things that we're used to calling prime numbers. But we also have to throw zero into the mix, too. Zero is a prime ideal inside the integers. If for no other reason than the integers, it turns out to be an integral domain. All right. Questions, comments? All right, what I want to do then is I'm going to give you the last homework assignment of the semester. It'll be due, it'll be due a week from Wednesday, so it'll be the standard homework schedule, but I'll have them graded and available for return by the following Friday so that you can use it to study for the exam. And here it is, so home. Again, last assignment of the semester is this. Uh, in section 27, Problems 5 through 9, 14, 18, and 19. I want you to turn in 18 and 19. And then in section 29, problem 18A and B. I want you to turn that in. And two more. Uh, give the isomorphism. We'll give that word on Wednesday from the complex numbers to this factor ring, mod x squared plus 1 times r bracket x. So it turns out we will eventually show that that's a field. We're on our way to doing that. In fact, that field turns out to be a field isomorphic to the complex numbers. That's first. And secondly, uh, mimic example. 29.19 to find a field, field having eight elements, having 
eight elements. And let's see, what else do I want you to do here? Uh, give the multiplication table for the field table uh, let x bar be denoted by alpha as we did here. All right, we already, at least tonight, sort of opened up this idea that inside a factor ring, well, if you look at a factor ring that looks something like this, there's the coset generated by x, that's this thing, and it might actually have certain properties that we can identify, like its square might be 2. It turns out you'll be able to play the same sort of game by looking at an appropriate factor ring of z2x, and they show you how to do that in example 29.9, and I want you to turn both of those in as well. Okay, And again, that'll be the last homework assignment for the semester. Let's see. Right, so so this will be yeah, this will be due uh, Wednesday, December fifth. But uh, since there's no class, just get it to me, email or fax or however you want to get this assignment to me, will be fine, and then I'll have them grade.